So I'm going to let uh, the, my uh, colleagues up here introduce ourselves, and then we'll start talking, and then we'll open up for questions in a little bit. Hello, everyone. My name is Susan Caputo. I am a licensed social worker. I hold a master's degree in social work from Rutgers, and I have a certificate in aging. I am the director of the ESCOPE program, uh, which we'll, we'll talk about in detail in a few minutes, but we are a grant-funded program as discussed by Trinitas Regional Medical Center and RWJ. Um, with that being said, I am gonna pass it over now. Hi, uh, my name is Walter Rhodes. I'm a um, DO. Uh, I work, actually I work for Dr. Scheintal. He's my boss. I'm the assistant chair, <laughs> a vice chair at um, Rowan as well. Uh, but for the last four years, I have been uh, part-time working uh, with Rowan and I've been the medical director for Oaks Integrated Care. Uh, so I uh, oversee different programs in Oaks and one of the programs that I oversee is the screening center in Camden County. Good morning everybody. <clears throat> uh, Mike D'Amico, I'm a licensed clinical social worker, I'm vice president at Oaks Integrated Care. Um, I too graduated from Rutgers. Maybe we were in the same class. I don't even know. Uh, I also adjunct at Rutgers now in the social work program. Um, uh, like I said, I'm a vice president at Oaks. I oversee our ambulatory and acute care uh, services for the organization. Uh, just for context, Oaks, um, we serve uh, really, I, I think, about uh, 14 counties in the state. Um, so we provide addictions treatment services, uh, outpatient ambulatory care. Uh, crisis services in Camden County. We're also on the forefront of implementing models such as the Certified Community Behavioral Health Clinic, uh, which I'll probably talk about a little bit more later, um, which is a really exciting new model of integrated care that has been implemented over the past five years uh, nationally. And uh, for the first time in a very long time, actually heard President uh, Biden uh, speak about the CCBHC and behavioral health in his State of the Union address last month, which is really exciting and really, I think, shows uh, where behavioral health, mental health, health is in terms of, uh, you know, the landscape and the priorities of, of the nation. So that's who I am, and I'll pass the mic back to over to, to Walt. Well, why don't you, so, so Mike, keep, yeah. the, keep the, th the mic. So, you know, you, you mentioned the community behavioral health model, but, you know, I'm, I'm hearing patients saying that there are, like, mental health urgent care centers. So why would someone go to a crisis center, and how does that differ from the urgent care center, and what is the urgent care center? Yeah, so the urgent care uh, model, it's known as uh, early intervention screening and support services uh, in New Jersey, and uh, I, I maybe this is a healthcare general thing, but we're so acronym heavy, um, and uh, so it's known as EISS, but we brand it as urgent care mental health, because that is in fact what it is. Um, and, uh, you know, bringing parity to uh, the urgent care concept on the physical health side, you know, to the behavioral health side. So uh, EISS, or I'll just refer to it as urgent care mental health, is a model that has existed in the state for, you know, well over a decade. Um, but actually, uh, just recently, the state has finally awarded um, the rest of the urgent care grants for the remaining counties in the state. So uh, at this point, um, I think probably in June, all 21 counties in New Jersey will have an urgent care mental health uh, program uh, somewhere in the county operated by a behavioral health organization um, or a hospital partner. Um, so the concept of the urgent care mental health program is similar to the concept of, of urgent care in the uh, physical health space in that uh, it's, it's meant as a diversionary uh, to get people to uh, you know, go to receive care, initiate care um, when they're experiencing an acute or subacute sort of a crisis in lieu of going to the emergency room or crisis screening. Um, you know, as we'll talk about in a little bit, you know, the role of crisis is really to make sure that we're um, you know, screening individuals for uh, inpatient, you know, care if it's necessary and making sure that we're stabilizing them if they are in fact a danger to self or others, whereas the role of the urgent care really is more to initiate treatment. Um, and so we hope that uh, as folks are walking into the clinic and into the facility that we're able to stabilize them immediately and begin care um, and provide them with care for up to eight to ten weeks while we work with them to find more um, sustainable services uh, within the community. So it really has been a lifeline in diverting people from ED um, and avoiding overutilization and burden on the emergency department, but really improving the client experience of care, right, uh, in that 
it's much more beneficial for somebody to go to an urgent care clinic to have care initiated immediately than it is to go to an emergency department, be given medication for a day or two, only to be returned back to the community. Um, and we also know this is one of the other benefits of urgent care mental health is the transition back to community. Um, you know, even for folks that are going into the emergency department for physical health care needs, making sure that once those things are triaged and stabilized, that they're linked and connected with uh, their primary or a specialist that can follow up with them on what they were seen at in the emergency department. On the behavioral health side, you know, we see a lot of folks that drop off in terms of their connection and linkage to aftercare after they've been seen at the emergency department. So one of the benefits with urgent care is not is that we're not just stabilizing the person, but we're providing them with treatment, and then we're making sure that they have access to long-term care in the community to prevent you know, decompensation and further, you know, uh, further crisis episodes. So, so Mike, sticking with that for a second, because I just noticed right in the front row is uh, one of my emergency department uh, physician partners, Dr. Tomasco, who's uh, at the Stratford ED, actually. Um, you're very familiar with that ED. Um, so, so if any of the ED physicians in the audience get a patient in who they think needs mental health care, can they discharge them to a mental health urgent care center, or do they have to wait for screening to come into the emergency room? And do they make a phone call and set an appointment, or is it walk-in? What happens? Yeah, yeah. So um, happened a couple different ways, um, but absolutely we have folks that are discharged from the EDs um, all the time. Um, so the goal is to get them from the ED over to urgent care. They can, you can send them to walk in. Um, it's usually helpful when, when we have either a physician or the, the charge nurse or somebody call over, give a little bit of context, uh, provide a little bit of information. But the individual doesn't have to be screened necessarily to go uh, over to urgent care mental health. You know, it could also be somebody who's, you know, coming in with some, uh, some other kind of physical health issue and, you know, you all are seeing that there's a secondary psychiatric diagnosis that they would require treatment for. Um, and that's, again, somebody that you uh, should absolutely send over uh, to one of your local urgent care centers. Um, you know, and for, for those that are in a county other than the ones that Oaks serves, which is Cumberland and Camden, with respect to urgent care, um, I think that developing those partnerships and that dialogue and developing those workflows uh, is really critical. Um, you know, it could, uh, I know we've seen that a lot in Cumberland County and Camden County where, you know, EDs are very much aware of what we offer. Um, the once they're stabilizing somebody and they're making sure that they're medically cleared to leave and they don't have an acute psychiatric, uh, you know, uh, issue, that they're discharging them and sending them right over to us. And then, you know, calling us and providing us with some context and information uh, so we understand, hey, maybe there was some medication y'all gave them. So as we're doing our psychiatric evaluation and prescribing medications, you know, we're aware of what those things might be. Right. So, you know, Dr. Rhodes, uh, I hear, you know, in passing and, and you know, <clears throat> from primary care colleagues, you know, I sent the patient to crisis and then they get sent home. So why does that happen? Well, the, the real goal of the crisis center is, uh, like Mike had said, is to stabilize the patient, stabilize the person. Uh, and make sure that they get the appropriate treatment. So um, we don't always, the crisis center doesn't always feel that um, someone may necessarily need to be hospitalized to get the appropriate treatment. Like Mike had just said, the, um, uh, the EISS can, can help be very st stabilized. So I mean, the great thing about th that program is that because you know, I've done it in the past as well. We get a patient coming in that day, the, the, um, uh, the social worker sees the patient, and then the psychiatrist will see the patient that very same day. So that uh, can, can decrease the crisis right away without having to hospitalize the patient. As we know, um, in New Jersey certainly, but in, across the nation, there's a, um, uh, not enough beds, inpatient beds. So having the patient wait in the ED for a, a, you know, a few days, a week, uh, is very problematic for the ED. As he's shaking his head. Um, and we'd rather stabilize the patient not in the ED as opposed to admitting them. So that's, uh, that's one of the reasons, to your, one of the answers to your question. The other answer is that in New Jersey, part of 
the screening's job is to make sure that there is um, the the person does the person's mental illness rises to the point where it is an imminent risk to self or others, and that's what the screener's job is, as well as the psychiatrist, to make sure that we're not violating their civil rights um, and forcing them to be hospitalized. So. Does everyone who go to crisis, you said everyone at mental health will see, at um, urgent mental health care will see a psychiatrist. Is that what happens in the crisis center as well? Uh, no, not necessarily. Really? So, so it sounds like the, the urgent mental health walk-in center, you're going to get a more holistic, rounded care Absolutely. than in the crisis center. So who do they see in the crisis center? So in the crisis center, they'll see the... Um, Crisis screener, that's which actually, is, which is uh, a social worker. I, I don't, yeah. yeah, so New Jersey is definitely different than, than some of the other states in terms of uh, how the crisis, uh, crisis works. I know there was a, a physician that we work with at one of the hospitals who comes from Pennsylvania, uh, which is, has a much different setup. So in New Jersey, the process is that uh, if an individual is in imminent risk and uh, we're considering uh, their, that they go inpatient uh, involuntarily to a hospital, they actually need to be assessed and evaluated by a certified screener. Uh, the certification happens uh, through the state of New Jersey. Um, those individuals uh, have certain credentials. They're not doctors. They're typically social workers and counselors um, and the like. Uh, so once, they're, uh, once they do their evaluation and they make their determination, uh, then it's also up to a physician to do their evaluation and, and agree with that. So as Walt mentioned, you know, it's um, very heavily focused on patient rights uh, and making sure that you know, as we're making the determination to involuntarily commit somebody, you're really taking away their civil liberties and uh, you know, putting them in a hospital in an institutional setting. So you know, the state takes that very seriously and has a system of checks and balances to ensure uh, that we're not making you know, uh, decisions in silos, uh, but with what we're considering you know, uh, different vantage points and viewpoints and making that uh, ultimate decision to involuntarily commit somebody or discharge them uh, back into the community. So, you know, full disclosure, I've worked in crisis centers, and I know at times nursing homes, like, send patients in, and then they're very angry that they're being sent back, or we're, they'll refuse to take them back, which is a whole nightmare in terms of their license. So, um, Susan, you said you're from this ESCO program. What can you tell us about that? Yes. Yeah. So, I am from ESCO, which is statewide clinical outreach program for the elderly. We serve nursing facilities in the whole state of New Jersey. We are a free program, and we serve 55 and older. Any client that presents to the screening center can automatically be referred to us by your nursing facility or the screening center themselves. With that being said also, we would like to divert that client from presenting to the screening center though. If it is an unnecessary referral, meaning that they will not meet the criteria for commitment, we would like to come out and divert them before sending the client to the nursing, I mean, to the screening center. With that being said, if a client states um, they want to commit suicide and it's more or less a passive death wish rather than a suicidal statement, we would like to come out and intervene before you send them to the screening center. We use non-pharmacological recommendations. We are a very unique program, um, which is great because we're a free program, but we also have everyone on our team. We have general psychiatrists, we have an advanced practitioner nurse, we have RNs, and we have licensed social workers and LPCs. So we have a very big team, and it really covers all our bases. Besides the recommendations that we can offer, we can offer educational training for your staff. So with that being said, there was a question earlier what can I do when the nursing facility calls me about all the behaviors that keep occurring, but I know they are not to be treated with geriatric medication? Uh, with that being said, we can come out and provide that training if you don't have the time. Our staff is very equipped. We have trainings, full list of paper, and that does not limit us. We also provide regional trainings on very heavy topics in the community this year, and then we hold a conference. So we have a bulk 
of services to offer. So, um, well, you mentioned um, imminent risk. So what is the commitment? Like, if, if someone's going to go in voluntarily, like if I come into the crisis center or I go into an emergency room and I, I say to Wayne, who I'm friendly with, you know, Wayne, I want an MRI. Wayne doesn't go, okay, Steve, I'll give you an MRI. Wayne does a full assessment. So if a patient comes in or a doctor sends someone into crisis and they say they want to be admitted, do they just get admitted? Is it like the pass-through center or what happens? No, they just don't get admitted, right? Like, we, like I had said earlier, um, even if they're, well, certainly if, if they want to get Im admitted, um, uh, there's a criteria that has to be met for inpatient admission. And really, it, it does, again, for a short-term care facility, it's that there is still a, a crisis, an emergency crisis going on right now that can't be dealt with in the outpatient setting. Uh, so someone that is, you know, imminently suicidal wants to get admitted. I mean, that's uh, more of an emergency. They have a plan. They have a, um, a very intricate plan. You know, that's a, an emergency that someone would need to be in. But someone that is, uh, like uh, you mentioned earlier, passively suicidal or just having those thoughts, they can certainly be treated. Uh, outside of the hospital in, in multiple different programs. So, you know, it would seem to me in, in all my nursing home and assisted living work, if someone comes in who's got pretty advanced dementia, they don't necessarily know what they're talking about, right? They're, there's not, Correct. it seems imminent to the staff, but it's really the patient may not understand what they're saying, you know, uh, you know, they say, I've seen it happen. You know, the, the family's there and they say, if you leave me here, I'm gonna kill myself. And then everyone gets up in arms, but the family leaves and then they're like playing bingo and they're going to dinner and they're, you know, watching movies. So, you know, is that crisis or is that S-Cope? So that would be S-Cope. Correct, and we would go out and we would do a face-to-face -face assessment we can be out within two hours. The other day, I was at a facility within 10 minutes after the call. Our response time is very quick. We will respond at max within the 24 hours. We do a face-to-face. -face. After the face-to-face, -face, we do leave the facility with written recommendations and paperwork. So as soon as we walk out the door, you already have um, how you're starting to treat this client. With that, we then provide a follow-up and we go back, we consult with our gyropsychiatrist weekly, and we do case reviews weekly. So where are the offices located that you can get there in two hours? That's, you know. <laughs> so our offices are statewide, as I discussed. Um, with that, they are in Parsippany, Cranford, Wall, New Jersey, and Stratford. Right. Well, that's cool. Mm -hmm. um, Mike, you, you mentioned this. Um, community behavioral health model that President Biden mentioned. Um, you know, do you mind elaborating on that? Because I don't think most people here. Sure. So the Certified Community Behavioral Health Clinic, um, the, I, I guess maybe the best way I can sort of describe the concept of it is it's similar to uh, the uh, FQHC or Federally Qualified Health Clinics. Uh, concept that was a designation made by the federal government. Um, but this is, uh, the emphasis here is on the behavioral health side. So the CCBHC um, was, uh, was really born out of legislation back in 2015. Um, and uh, that legislation then uh, set the stage for a Medicaid uh, demonstration project that was uh, supported by SAMHSA um, and was funded, uh, again, by a a, as a Medicaid demonstration po uh, project under legislation in, in, in at the federal level. And it started in 2017 in seven states in the country. New Jersey was one of the first uh, states to be involved, and Oaks Integrated Care was one of the first of about 70 organizations throughout the country to um, implement the model. So the CCBHC, as we call it, uh, has been gaining a lot of momentum over the past five years. Uh, it provides wraparound care and a very broad continuum of services. So it provides everything from you know, ambulatory, outpatient care, uh, to care management in the community, peer services, psychiatric rehabilitation, so things like supportive employment, supported housing, 
um, addictions treatment, including medication-assisted treatment, uh, so MAT, uh, as well as a, a whole host uh, of other things. One of the main emphasis uh, of the program is access to care. Um, so uh, recognizing that uh, you know access to care and uh, has been just a such a, a huge challenge for behavioral health over the past few years. This model and the way that it was developed. Um, was really designed to uh, promote and increase access to care. And it also puts um, our behavioral health services, you know, on some of the same level in terms of our outcomes and what we're looking at in terms of performance and so on uh, as, as other healthcare facilities. So for the first time, um, behavioral health is being measured using HEDIS measures. So this project was really innovative in that way on the behavioral health side as well. Um, but the other, the other concept uh, beyond the access is reducing silos to care. So, uh, so making sure that as folks are coming into a facility uh, that we are uh, working together, there's care coordination and collaboration, and you know, we're not having people you know, sending them all over the county for different services, but rather operating as a hub and spoke sort of a model to make sure that the person's care is centralized um, and that the care with, you know, within that facility or with partner facilities is coordinated and collaborative. Um, so it's, uh, again, I was mentioning that it's, um, it was mentioned in President Biden's address. So it's a Medicaid demonstration project um, in 2017. There were some expansion grants that SAMHSA uh, had budgeted for uh, since then. Um, but uh, the, the demo is really the gold standard of what we hope certified community behavioral health clinics will be into the future. Uh, the other thing that it brings um, with it is uh, a cost-based reimbursement model. So behavioral health has also been challenged um, by uh, typically or traditionally lower rates, um, and has, has kind of struggled in that way. And so for the first time, there's a, now a model of care that is uh, cost-based in terms of its reimbursement and payment methodology and really allows uh, the organizations that are providing the care flexibility to do a lot of different new and innovative things, again, similar to what you see on the federally uh, qualified health care centers. Um, so, and there also is an emphasis on uh, primary care. So as an example, in our CCBHC clinic in Mercer County that was a demonstration project, uh, we actually uh, worked with our FQHC partner in the county, uh, Henry J. Austin, um, and they were offering some satellite uh, primary care services on our site. Uh, and through that partnership, we uh, decided that, you know, let's take this one step further. And we actually uh, built out a, an ambulatory care facility within our behavioral health facility. So, uh, which eventually became licensed um, so that uh, Henry J. Austin is eligible to bill and provide services directly in our facility. So now, in, and, and I'm still could be the case, but at the time it was uh, the first uh, ambulatory, licensed ambulatory care clinic within a behavioral health clinic um, in the state of New Jersey. So it was pretty innovative in that way. Uh, and essentially the concept was you walk in, you're getting services, behavioral health care services, and you know if you have uh, an urgent need or if you want to have a routine checkup with your primary, you walk down the hallway and you go into the Henry J. Austin suite and uh, receive care from them. So it was a really cool concept and um, you know something that, again, would not have really been possible without this whole CCBHC sort of a, a framework. Okay. Um, so for, for all three of you, what happens if the decision from mental health urgent care, from crisis, from S-COPE, the, the primary physician or the family disagrees with the determination. Is there a recourse? Is there a second look? Is it, you know, what happens there? Well, I can say in screening, if, um, so if a screener sees the patient um, and they don't feel admission is needed, uh, then if there's a, a conflict uh, with anyone, family, uh, the emergency room physician, the primary care, then that's where the psychiatrist would certainly evaluate the patient at that point in time. Uh, if there's still a conflict at that point in time, then actually the medical director of, of the screening center would get involved, so that would be me. So there would be another um, uh, level, so to speak. So if a physician, one of our colleagues here, referred someone into screening, should they get a call from the screener, or is that typically not what happens, that a call is not a routine part of that? 
Well, I can't say that the call is normally routine at that point in time. Uh, what I can say, though, from a screening point of view, um, is that uh, getting as much information is, is very helpful. Um, just had a patient uh, that was in, I just had a patient from one of my programs that was just admitted, and I myself called the screening center, told them what was going on, uh, you know, my, my concerns and whatnot, and it, and it was helpful to get, move the patient along and get his treatment. What about Esco? So, Esco, um, if someone does not agree with us, we typically don't work with the family. The facility is our client, but we will, there is no limit to our service. So, we will go out, we can re reassess, we always review with our general psychiatrist. And if it's a challenging case and we're looking for additional recommendations, we do have a program called ECHO, and we can present this case on ECHO, which is on telehealth. And at that point, we have an additional geropsychiatrist review the medications, the recommendations that were given, the case, the behavior observation at this time, and we can also offer a doc-to-doc -doc at that point. I'll just add one thing I think that's important just to, to sort of uh, emphasize what Walt was saying is uh, the discussion with family and, and collateral. So, you know, a lot of times folks may be presenting differently when they get to the crisis unit than they might have been in the community. Um, and so getting different sources of information, you know, is, is really critical uh, in terms of formulating the decision about the assessment and the decision uh, about involuntary uh, commitment. So one of the things I've run into a lot, and I know, Mike, you and I have talked about this, and Walt and I have talked about this, not so much with nursing home patients, but there's secondary gain, right? You know, families want someone placed, they want them out of the house, the person's homeless, they're not fully disclosing that they're homeless. Um, how, how do you sift through the, the secondary gain issues? Because I, I, I know, for me, those become very challenging because you can hear two very, very different situations. Um, and, you know, I don't know that there's a right answer, but I think the difference in perspective is, it might be interesting. Yeah, and it happens with kids a lot too. Um, I think that's where we, we see it a lot in, in terms of uh, can't manage the behavior, we don't have the resources to manage the behavior. Um, you know, a lot of times some of the resources are, we're, are intervening with the family as well. And so um, in, the, in a lot of these situations where we see that the family might be burdened, you know, there's resources available, you know, for the family. Um, but just to back up in terms of, of the assessment, you know, we do need to take into consideration, you know, what the person's living environment is. And crisis really does have a limited capacity in terms of, you know, what it can do kind of in long term in, in terms of recommending care and, and, and so on after the fact. Um, but uh, working with the family to set up and establish resources if the person's not going to be uh, committed um, for, for aftercare, right? So uh, identifying, you know, the different social determinant of health uh, kinds of needs that the individual might have and making sure that we're making appropriate recommendations to address those things. Um, so there's services to address homelessness, there's services to address environmental resource needs. Um, and, uh, but then at, at the same time, what I was alluding to earlier was working with the family and, and connecting them with things, uh, services like our, uh, our, our family uh, support services, right, which offer uh, different groups and individual work to family members who are caring for an individual with, you know, a mental health or, or substance use uh, diagnosis. Um, or, or NAMI is another good resource uh, for family members to be able to discuss and meet with peers and other family members who are experiencing some of the same, uh, bless you, experiencing some of the same, uh, same challenges. And I think that helps to give families some perspective, it helps to give them some hope, um, and it helps to include them in the treatment process uh, as well, which I think is, is really critical. Um, but so I, I think giving family resources, um, helping them in developing the care plan um, and involving them in the process um, and empowering them. I think when families don't feel empowered, they also feel this, you know, well, they need to be committed. I, I, there's nothing I really can do. But when we, we start to talk to them about resources in the community and how we can connect them, uh, I think it builds that trust, it builds that empowerment um, and helps them to buy into, uh, buy into a plan uh, because really our goal is the least restrictive means necessary. Uh, we don't want to commit somebody uh, unless it's otherwise absolutely necessary. And so if we can come up with a care plan that keeps them in the community, you know, that's, that's the goal. Right. How do you handle that? Because, I, you know, from the physician standpoint, I mean, 
while well, we I all mean, from the physician standpoint, I, I agree with you. There's never necessarily a right answer to that. Uh, but I can say just um, just yesterday, I had a patient that a very similar presentation. They weren't necessarily in the crisis center, but the, the um, family was demanding one thing that really was not appropriate for the patient. Uh, and getting actually what we, what uh, other than trying to talk with the, the family and trying to get everyone on the same plan, um, one of the things we did recommend is the um, family support service uh, program that uh, uh, Oaks does have to give the family uh, as much support as they can during these trying times until the patient was able to, to formulate a, um, uh, a better plan, healthy choices, uh, a healthy choice. So although we haven't spoke about it, I feel like the nursing homes do play a part in this also, whether they are sending a client to screening, because unfortunately they are short staff at this time. We get some clients that are wandering, wandering the unit, and they will see that as a problematic behavior. Um, we like to look in, why are they wandering? In addition to that, sometimes families are having a difficult time with dealing with the process of, unfortunately, their parents are now aging and they have become the parent in a different aspect. With that, it is difficult to sometimes look at your parent with dementia-related behaviors um, and the person they once knew, unfortunately, is not acting like that anymore. So we then have to also sympathize with the family and come up with recommendations that we are in the best interest for the dementia-related behaviors that are taking place. Great. You guys okay if we open it up for questions? So I don't know if we covered everything, probably not, but what questions, you know, it's a unique opportunity to hear, you know, multiple um, aspects of the state's mental health safety net. Um, which you all intersect for your patients. So I'm from Gloucester County. Um, so can we go to Oaks in Camden County or Cumberland County with my patients? How do, how do we access care for, since you're not in our county? Sure, so we, and we partner a lot with Ascenda who is in, uh, they're actually the screening center in Gloucester County. So uh, they were actually awarded the Gloucester County um, Urgent Care Mental Health or EISS program. Uh, but you know, the, the beautiful thing about urgent care is that it does not um, limit by geographic area. So I know we had worked with Rowan University too on some of their students in Gloucester County. And a lot of them were going to Cumberland or Camden County depending because uh, Gloucester at that point didn't have it. We get people from Pennsylvania, we get people from Delaware. So, um, but yeah, there's there's really no geographic limitations. Ascenda, can you, is it A-S-C-E-N-D-A? Oh, yes, A-C-E-N-D-A. It uh, used to be Robin's Nest, uh, Cape Counseling, and North Point? Uh, New Point, Behavioral New Point. Health. Hello, I'm just going to relate a funny anecdote. About 15 years ago, I was a doctor in the Appalachian Mountains, and the deputy sheriff came to my office, and he told me one of my patients was threatening to kill me and that I should lay low for a while. I don't know how to lay low. I don't know what that means. And uh, about five days later, my office, front office started screaming because they saw him walking to the front door. They locked the front door, the whole office cleared out the back, and then the patient came up and tried to open the door. So I walked up to the door and I opened it. And I said, hi, can I help you? And he said, hi, doc, I, I just wanna let you know that I'm not mad at, wait, with you. That was just a way for me to get into the hospital. So he either had to be <laughs> suicidal or homicidal. He picked homicidal. <laughs> <laughs> So it was a swing and a miss. I was okay, but uh, I just want to let you know that it, it was a challenge to open the front door for him. <laughs> oh. I, I, I think that's the challenge we face, right? Is when I was talking about secondary gain. Yeah, you, you know, we're 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 um, 
It, it's funny you know, you say that because uh, we work with the Camden Coalition for Healthcare Providers in Camden County, and one of the things we were looking at were high utilizers of ED service, and uh, we were working with some of the docs and so on, and looking at some Z code diagnoses, and to really identify some of the the social determinant kinds of issues that folks are walking in with, and you know what we found was that a lot of people were accessing the ED and you know, uh, reporting, maybe not that they were homicidal or suicidal, although it does happen, um, but uh, you know, presenting with other, other issues and concerns, um, but really the underlying need was much different than any physical or even behavioral health issue. It was more about some environmental and concrete resource needs that that individual had. And so you know, it is trying to, to kind of sift through that and get to the, the core and the root of really what the need is um, and I think at times, you know, people aren't even as conscious of, you know, why they might be doing it, right? And so it's our job to sort of play detective and figure out, you know, what is sort of at the, at the core of what this person really needs. And I think ESCO can piggyback off of that um, because we do see the residents that are in, in the nursing home and their day is spent in the nursing home. I mean, we saw it during the pandemic, they weren't even allowed out of their rooms. And during that time, an ambulance ride to the screening center was just that little bit of satisfaction. Yeah, and it's the same thing with the group homes that we, we dealt with and residential programs, you know, and during the lockdown and during pandemic. Um, and even now, don't like my day program. I've been there every day or I'm sitting in my room on telehealth. You know, it's it definitely, yeah. So trip to screening as a field trip outing. I, I think there's a probably a, a well-known guy at, at crisis and he comes in I know they give him a sandwich and a cup of coffee and uh, he's not homicidal or suicidal anymore and he's happy to go back to his group home and everything like that so yeah. hi I have a, a lot of Medicaid right and I do use integrated oaks but I don't want to feel like I'm using you obsessively because <laughs> they kind of crash and burn most of the time so I feel like I need your support system and more knowledge on you, what you use because I feel like it's that secondary visit mm -hmm. a lot of times that is hard to do the follow-up and try and get a better diagnosis for the patient. So. Oh, de definitely. I, you know, that, that I think does the, the initiate, the, that initial appointment is one thing, but you know, the, the engagement, that second appointment within 14 or 30 days is, is really the, you know, the, the key, you know, and, and, uh, I know Dr. Peninti, who I think is talking later, Rowan, yep. you know, that's his, what he says too, is that, you know, our primary job is to make sure the person comes back um, for the second visit. That's our, that's our job at the first visit, right? To make sure that they come back. But, um, but you know, I, I mean, I'm more than happy, anybody who's in our, our territory to talk more and, and meet and, uh, you know, figure out. There's sometimes unique challenges that certain uh, facilities or clinics have and uh, you know we, we welcome partnerships and establishing different you know specific workflows and and so on so you know I'll be around afterwards if you know you want to chat yeah so we actually be started an ambulatory withdrawal management um, clinic in um, in Mercer County so it uh, operates a level one ASAM, so uh, level one and level two. So it, that we do uh, home induction uh, as well as um, uh, on site with uh, monitoring. Uh, we don't do inpatient withdrawal management. What we found though is that many of the folks, our system in New Jersey was really geared toward people going inpatient for withdrawal management and induction, even though it wasn't really clinically uh, necessary, um, especially for opiates. And so when we opened up our withdrawal management uh, facility, um, working with folks, and we were working with alcohol, benzos, and, and opiates, um, we found that there was a lot of folks that we would have otherwise sent inpatient that we were now able to, to treat. Um, but the state, uh, you know, we had advocated for this for, for years along with Dr. Peninti. Um, about uh, being able to license behavioral health facilities to do uh, home induction as well because we felt there were a lot of folks that could tolerate it. I think the beautiful part, I could talk forever about withdrawal management and, and detox and MAT, but the beautiful part about it is, um, and it's kind of at the core, core uh, thing of what we're talking about here, is if you can keep people in the community and while they're getting treatment, um, I think that's the best outcome, right, in, in terms of what we do. So withdrawal management, ambulatory withdrawal management, you know, lets people, um, you know, live their lives and, and, you know, go on living their chosen valued role while they're getting care. Um, and uh, so, so we do offer that, uh, but we refer out for outpatient. The other thing we do, which is, uh, has been going on for, for a while in New Jersey and all 21 counties offer it, is uh, the Opioid Overdose Recovery Program, or ORP. Um, so any hospital providers or, or folks in here may be aware of it. 
Um, but ORP is a service that provides a bedside intervention to individuals who were reversed with Narcan uh, from an opiate, uh, from an opiate uh, overdose. Uh, and it helps to do the bedside intervention with a peer specialist and then works with them to uh, link to community-based care. And they do that all right in the emergency departments. So I, I'm actually quite excited by what you just mentioned as a physician who works in primarily Burlington and Mercer counties. I had no idea we had a community detox program, so I'm not letting you leave here without more information on that. Um, one of the big things I've dealt with, at, especially during COVID, um, is the rebound from inpatient psychiatric stays, um, people being discharged back in the community with loose follow-up or no follow-up and then not being accepted back into that inpatient hospital. And I'm talking schizophrenics, manic bipolar, people who still have pressured speech. One person recently who was homicidal, um, inpatient admitted and then released and still was like psych literally psychotic. Um, do, can we utilize if they are like a little better than they were when they went in and they're no longer threatening to stab me? Can I use EISS for that? Is that appropriate or what other recourse do we have? Ab absolutely. So one thing I'll mention that that's new and, and a lot of, again, hospital people here are very acutely familiar with uh, the QUIP, the uh, Quality Improvement Project for, from New Jersey Medicaid. And one of uh, a few of the measures are looking at the transition back into the community and their engagement with care. And so that's really incentivizing a lot of healthcare systems to partner with behavioral health care clinics um, and how to make those connections and how to make those connections uh, meaningful in terms of folks being discharged and connecting back out into uh, in, into the community. Just to kind of validate what you're saying a little bit, um, we were I was looking at a few years ago and we were starting the CCBHC. Uh, what was our uh, what were our show rates for people for that initial admission appointment from an inpatient psychiatric facility? And the show rate was as low as 25 to 30 percent. Um, you know, and so one of the things, again, with the CCBHC model that we are able to pilot and work on, uh, and we were doing this actually with Capital Health, um, but we were going on the inpatient unit and uh, doing admissions and transition plans on the inpatient unit to get people to come into the community. Uh, you know, it's quite a daunting task to say, you know, I've been in the hospital for two weeks or a week, I have schizophrenia and other kind of, you know, psychotic disorders, and here's a card, and, you know, you're gonna go into the community and just go to some random building you've never been to and talk to people you've never talked to before, and, you know, we wish you well. I mean, that's really what the model is, and um, so, so I guess bringing up QUIP, there's some systemic changes, I think, that are really promoting this, this better, improved transition of care uh, kind of a concept. And then there's systems, you know, like our CCBHCs and like our EISS programs um, that are there to be able to, you know, receive those folks. Um, and I think it's our job to kind of figure out how those things kind of connect and mesh. So, uh, so I'd be happy to talk a little bit more about that, um, but yeah. So, you know, one of the questions before we go to the next question, with, um, it's so hard with masks to see who people actually are, but what about outreach? Like community outreach for a patient who may be not stable at home? We didn't talk about that at all, um, but I know that's an option. Yeah, oh, for crisis. Yeah. Yeah, so um, well, while we operate in the hospitals, um, you know, we, uh, crisis, every crisis, you know, team throughout the state um, does outreach in the community at the individual's home as well. So the person does not need to present at the emergency department to receive uh, a crisis intervention. So, you know, we get calls, you know, somebody who's on uh, a train platform or, you know, somebody who's at the transit center in Camden County. Um, so, you know, we make mobile outreach uh, to that individual. Uh, we do our assessment uh, with them there. Uh, and if they need to be you know, screened further and assessed for inpatient uh, care, we bring them back to the emergency department so they can be medically cleared and you know, take the next, uh, the next few steps. But being out in the community is huge. Um, and I know we had another question, but 988 is coming out soon. And I'm sure uh, some, many may be familiar with what 988 is, but it's the new uh, national suicide um, hotline uh, that was passed through federal legislation that passed 988. Um, and it's supposed to replicate 911 in both simplicity uh, and severity um, of, of, uh, of the calls in response to suicide uh, individuals who are experiencing suicidal ideation. And so what we're gonna see uh, on the back end of that is some other legislation and some other funding to support increased mobile outreach 
um, to help meet people in the community, uh, to provide some stabilization, even when folks are not in uh, an immediate risk of harming uh, themselves uh, or, or somebody else, but to try to uh, stabilize them, initiate services, and uh, really connect with them where they are. How do we find out about our EISS if we're not in this region? Like I'm from Somerset County. So the Division of Mental Health and Addiction Services, so DMHAS, uh, has resources um, on there. Uh, they have links and information. Um, but you know, I think one of the first you know steps could be to just reach out with some of the behavioral health care facilities in Somerset County or Somerset County Department of Human Services. Uh, I think would probably be a good first place to start. And um, you know, there's lots of mental health board meetings that every county has. Uh, systems review committee meetings um, that are held that bring all these different partners together um, and uh, you know outside individuals are welcome so you know I think either you know using DMHAS's website uh, or connecting with your county uh, will be able to kind of help you know plant you uh, with all these other different com community partners providing lots of different things since so many of these folks wind up back in our offices how do you communicate with us how do we know what's happened? How do we know what the next plan is? I don't seem to get a ton of fan mail from the various behavioral health entities as far as what happened and what's going to happen next. So how, in what ways do you, assuming that they have a, a, a medical home, how do you communicate with us? Okay. Great question. So uh, do you mind if I just... Yeah. <laughs> We're all um, comfortable. All right. So, so, so two, two things. So uh, again, as an extension of our certified community behavioral health clinic, one of the focuses on that was care coordination and collaboration and uh, data exchange. So um, Oaks is pretty unique in what we're doing in this way. Uh, but what we are doing is we're working with the health information exchange uh, through, that's operated through the Camden Coalition and the Trenton Health Team. And we're actually going to be, hopefully, as long as we can get through some of these HIPAA 42 CFR Part 2 sorts of things, uh, be able to do bi-directional data exchange with the health information um, exchange platforms, which means that we'll be exchanging information that's viewable by hospital partners and primary care partners in the community um, to be able to view enrollment information or medication information and, and so on. So there's a lot of different use cases that we're using for that. But that's one, uh, that's, that's certainly one option. Uh, the other option on the technological side, there's a platform called Quartet that some of you, I don't know if anyone in here is familiar with Quartet by any chance. All right, I got a few, a few folks. So Quartet's a newer platform uh, that connects primary care and specialty providers with behavioral health clinics. So it's uh, both a referral platform as well as a data exchange platform. So we've been using Quartet for about two years. Um, it's owned or in partnership with Horizon Blue Cross uh, Blue Shield. Um, but referrals and information uh, can be made for individuals at your clinic with any type of insurance. So the idea behind Quartet, you're seeing somebody in your, your practice, uh, you're identifying they have a behavioral health need, uh, you click a button, I don't know how it works on the provider end so necessarily, but you click some kind of magic thing, it sends a referral through to Quartet, Quartet then sends that information out to uh, behavioral health providers that are in their network throughout the state. Um, and then once we uh, receive that referral and we admit the individual, then we provide uh, feedback and information back to Quartet who pushes that back to the doctor. So it might be things like PHQ-9 information, medication information, uh, treatment plan goals, you know, general things like that just to kind of give a snapshot. Uh, the other last thing I'll say too is just, um, you know, again, building those partnerships. So I know one, one of the things we're, we're trying to do, uh, we're always trying to do is build relationships with our, uh, with our primary care partners. We have nurses, nurse care managers, and, and care managers that are in the field, and they're usually very good resources uh, just to be exchanging information uh, in terms of what's going on with care, what their medications might be, so on and so forth. So it's that relationship building piece as well. Dr. Van Hittensauter gets the last question. And then I'm going to thank uh, just a much. comment. So we actively use Quartet in, in our practice. Um, we're, we just find it very difficult for them to communicate back with us with any substance. So we'll get back, patient stable, patient stable, and that's it. So if you're going to use them, just make sure you stay on them to uh, get useful information, not just two lines that say patient stable, patient stable. Agreed. A lot, lot of workflows on both ends with Quartet to make it functional in the way you want it to be functional. So, yeah, the feedback is important. So I, I want to thank you all for your attention, but I really want to thank the panel. Um, John Verney, who um, is the former director, the state director for the Screening Center for the from the Division of Mental Health and Addiction Services, 
who was supposed to be with us today, um, had another issue come up and, and couldn't join us. But um, John orchestrated this and I think really hit it out of the park. Um, John insisted that, that Mike be a part of this due to his depth of knowledge. And I think, Mike, you, you totally um, knocked that out of the park. Um, Walt, who introduced himself very modestly, is a Des Moines graduate and a Costin scholar and uh, does more for community mental health in the southern region than perhaps anyone else I know. And um, Susan, who also modestly introduced herself, is heavily relied on by the Department of Health. Um, for those of you who follow the whole Andover mess uh, from um, the um, COVID uh, crisis in the news, um, Susan and her team have been pulled uh, by the Department of Health to go in and do a deep dive into Andover and are making suggestions and evaluating patient by patient and are involved in that whole investigation. Um, and they're also called quietly into other facilities, not just by the facilities, but by the state. And so you really had a, a wonderful uh, heavy hitter team here today. And the reason I'm pulling that out is not only so that you know the quality of, of who presented to you today, but um, each one of these people gave up uh, very, very busy schedules to make time to be here for all of you, and I hope you really uh, appreciated it. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>